Hey, listeners, this is Alec, the producer of The Investor's Guide to Memphis Real Estate. And Dean and Douglas are off this week, but we still wanted to put together something special for y'all. So we curated the top 10 clips from the podcast that have gotten the most likes, views, and comments on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So we're calling this episode Fan Favorite Advice for the First Half of 2024. And this is also a little reminder that we put out clips of the show Monday through Friday on TikTok, Instagram Reels, Facebook Reels, and YouTube Shorts. So if you want to spice up your social media feeds with some great real estate investing content, give us a follow on those platforms. And before we dive into the clips, I want to give a quick shout out to our show sponsors. Those would be Crest Corp Property Management. You guys know that self-managing ends up being a disaster, so... Just leave it to the pros. It'll be worth your while. That's Crest Core Property Management. Then we've got Corland Financial. If you need a hard money loan, give them a call today. Then we've got Triumph Construction. If you're rehabbing and you need a trusted GC, Triumph Construction is your best option. And last but not least, we've got two great title and closing services companies we work with. Those would be Local Title and Griffin, Clift, Everton, and Mashmire. Dean and Douglas use these companies, and you should too. But without further ado, we'll start that top 10 clip countdown for you. I hope you enjoy, and we'll be back next week with a new episode. Enjoy. It's easier to own 50 than it is to own five. Uh, Yes. All If you leverage, I'll even clarify more. You and I both know. If you leverage a house and you obtain a mortgage on it, it is way easier to own 50 rental houses than it is five. Agree. Yeah. yeah. Personal experience. And and one thing you said in there that we've talked about before, but it's key is focus. Yeah. And sticking to what you know. Mm-hmm. So like you said, bringing in single family, single family, single family. You don't sprinkle in, uh, you know, a small multifamily and a commercial and no. a fix and flip no. and Wait, all of a sudden you're like, I'm a real estate investor doing all this. No, no, no. You're talking single family homes. Period. They, they are all the same thing. Yeah. And you're scaling that. Yes. You're not scaling units to scale into multifamily mm-hmm. and then get into commercial and then do some land and do development. And no. No, we're talking about owning a portfolio of single family homes that over time pay for themselves. I have a client that's a lawyer. He's a state planner. He yeah. had a lady come into his office and she was bragging essentially about how she just spent $450,000 on a home in California that was written for $2,200. She couldn't be any more thrilled. And of course he kept his opinion to himself, but yeah. you know, he owned 15 houses here that were getting $20,000 in rent, right? Yeah. That were, you know, a lot more than 440, but he was laughing. He's like, God, leave for 440 grand. I can get $5,000 in Memphis or more or yes. what have you. There's, there's my point. Yes. A California resident, when they get, you know, 0.5% return, they're thrilled, right? That she was bragging. You come over here and you get that. And it's like, we wouldn't touch it. Yeah. Right. So coming to Memphis for the cash flow is the main reason. Two houses to four to six, maybe eight. It's getting a little better. Yep. Now, all of a sudden, congratulations, you're at 10 and 11, okay? Let's just go with 12 even for a little cushion, okay? What's what's that difference? Yeah, you're over a million dollars in assets. You're working on paying those down to get a million dollars. Because the next step after a million dollars in is a little side, but after a million dollars in assets, it's a million dollars in equity. Is a million dollars in equity. You know, but and you can't have that with one or two houses. No. Not rental houses that we're talking about. So you got to build that portfolio. But having 10 houses, you know, it's the, it's, the insurance term, the law of large numbers. Mm -hmm. So it's the sample size. You talk about sample size being too small. It's like if you get a big enough sample size, it covers it. And that's what happens with these houses is, I don't want to say you don't notice, Mm -hmm. but you can weather the storm. It's diversification. So I bought last year, we had yeah. the rates were going up, but I bought uh, a good amount of Burr properties and a large majority of them fell between the 70 and 85,000 price range. They needed between 20 and $40,000 worth of yep. rehab. Okay. Um, I had a really high interest rate on those because everybody does and did. Um, so I extended my buy box last year and I extended my willingness threshold for cash flow. Uh-huh. Because um, at the, you know, eight and a half or nine or whatever they're locked in at, it's not going to be there forever, right? Yeah. Will it go back down to three? No. 
I'm not even planning on that, never. But can we get into the five and six range again? Of course. And there's, you know, there's what I'm waiting on. Mm-hmm. I I sacrificed and I was willing to pay the price financially to go ahead and accumulate more of those properties at 75 and 80 grand. Uh-huh. That's the baseline uh-huh. of the monthly rent is 1% of the purchase price. 1%. Yep. That, that's, that's what, if you hear somebody say, you know, we're looking for the 1% rule, that's exactly what they're looking for. They want to be all in. Their purchase price needs to be 1% or 1% of the purchase price is the rent. So, the month, okay. Yeah, it's the monthly rent. So, uh, you know, in most markets and in most climates, this works. Yeah, good rule of thumb. Good rule of thumb. You can typically cash flow um, in, in with the 1% rule. Uh, interest rates are going to vary, and you might have some different math on different properties. But in our experience, the 1% rule is a, is kind of the minimum of what guys want. There's If it's a new construction, they might take a little bit less than that. But for the most part, investors, in my opinion, are looking for at least that 1% rule. Yes. If you have a property that's underperforming, how long will you let it be in the red before you'd say it's maybe maybe sell that? It met your criteria at the beginning, but now you're X amount of time into it. It's running red. How do you get out of it? Because that look, right, yeah. when you buy these things, you yeah. know and I know. These are infant born babies. Yes, right, 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 right. <laughs> you know right, what I'm right. saying? Oh, I mean, oh, baby. sweetheart. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. So That's you, right. well, you nourish very and you much care. attached. So it's like selling them. It's an emotional drag. Because every time I thought about selling one of them, I'm like, man, I, let's, no. So I, I've got to get yeah. over the mental part of it. So I'm asking you just because you've been through this and this is helpful for anyone else that's listening. How long? Because that might be the question. Like, yeah, Dean Douglas, I'm running a 12 rental house portfolio here. And three of these have not made me any money in two or three. You know what I mean? How yeah. three, I, how I, long? I, 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 in a long perspective, I think everybody would say three out of five years. Okay. You know, I think their IRS rules are something to the fact if you're losing money three out of five years on a deal like what's a hobby versus a business yeah and if you're always losing money it's a hobby (laughs) i bet you've sold over 200 properties for me over the years over the years yeah Yeah. over 200 200. Mm -hmm. and i've probably sold another 400 Mm -hmm. and I, i went back and thought and i was like you know what i haven't sold my winners never no, I've sold the losers. Yeah. I've sold the ones that I've mismanaged. Yeah. So so, like- so what is that number? <laughs> you know, how embarrassing is that? So the point being that, hey, you come to a crisis yes. and it's what are you going to do? If you got four houses, it's like, oh, I'm on pins and needles with everything. Is that rent yeah. check coming in? Man, I'm watching all four rent checks. Oh, it's the fourth of the end. I can tell you now with my portfolio, and I know you, I don't look up at the rent in the month until the 15, 16, 17. I just don't. And even then, if something hadn't been paid, it's just a process. Let's just go get, you know, follow up and let's go get. Whereas if you got four, it's the six, then you got two of them in LA, you're thinking your business, you're about to go bankrupt. Yeah. Embarrassing story. I I wanted to keep a tenant in there. I thought keeping a tenant in there was the best thing you could do. Yeah. Right. So I I locked in a tenant on a five year lease yeah. with no rent increase. And so that was a mistake. Yeah, because you can put some rent increases. They call them escalators or some type sure. of built-in uh, increase for those lengthy leases. For those, if you're going to do something longer, longer term. So anyway, that's an example. Repair versus replace. Yeah. I think you mentioned that roof example. We used to know a guy. It's so funny. I never knew how he did it. But the dude would put half a roof on. Yeah. Right. That's clown activity. I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah. It yeah. is. So band-aids versus salt, you know, kind of treating the symptoms versus kind of treating the problem. Yeah. That that catches a, a, a lot of folks. And I've done that and been there. If you've got three bankers and you're buying property and you go to a banker every four months to borrow. Yeah. Versus the same banker once a month. Yeah. You're going to have a lot more long lasting relationship with that banker. Yeah. So, and those banks, from their perspective, they're managing their risk. A, they've got less outstanding with you. But B, and we've seen this, is they have in that scenario two other lenders mm-hmm. who, if something were to happen, might be able to take them, you know, it might be they could take that bank out. And now you have two banks. So, it, it's a, it's a great idea. Yeah. I, a great practice. Big time. I know people who swear by two ones, yeah. two bedroom, one bed, because not many people can live in a two one. 
So there's not necessarily a lot of damage that could potentially be done in a 2-1. Now, some people, 3 twos minimum because they want more rent. They want a bigger house. The market's bigger. More people can live there. So it's like. So you see what we're saying. Y- y- that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. like you got to figure out the criteria for you. Yeah. What it is you want. Some want brick homes. Some want a garage. Some want a carport. Some want detached. Some and, want attached. Some and here want... in Memphis, it can vary. It can I- I'll vary. tell you mine. I'll tell you one right yeah. now. A personal example. I only yeah. will take a 2-1 in Berkeley. Uh, as far as like. You got gotcha. you. Uh, as far as a 2-1, that's the only place you'll take I'm it. I'm not buying two ones in Memphis. Any- now. There are other areas that two ones work, right? But for you. But for me personally, I do not buy two ones outside of Berkeley, right? 38122 right across the street. Hey, getting your first house, that's a milestone. Getting your second house is a milestone. After that, you probably don't have a milestone until you get to 10 houses. Oh, you don't. You know? No, for a fact, you don't. When I bought my first one, I felt great. And when I bought the 12th and 13th one, I was like, whoa, now, yeah. now we're cooking. I, I, this is self-sustaining. Yes, you're building assets, and you probably, with 10 or 12, you're over a million dollars in assets. Yes, that's right. You know, so with these 100, just using a simple $100,000 valuation, which is a little low now. Yeah. Get 10 houses. You're a millionaire in assets. Yep. All those houses you talked about me buying last year, like I bought a bunch of them at like 8.75%, 9%. Yeah. And... That's awful, right? I can't, I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but here's the flip side of that coin. In the next year or so, when we get back down to that interest rate that's tolerable, all I'm going to do is refinance those back out. My cash flow goes back up, but the catch is I was, I'm not going to be able to get those $80,000 houses again that need $25,000 in work that are worth $140,000. Then you're going to be paying 140. And be paying 140 grand for them. If you want to know if you've got a good painter or not, Go into the house after you've hired them to paint. And I can't believe I'm saying this out loud, but I, this has happened to me on more than one occasion. Uh, you go into the house and they painted it, right? And you go in there and instead of pulling off the electrical outlets and the light switch uh, yeah. platelets, yeah. they just paint right over. It. They just paint right over. It. I've not, I, I don't have it anymore. But that is, that is a strong indicator that you had a very sloppy, lazy... Uh, yes. Not good contractor because he lets stuff like that happen. Correct. Let's just talk with one duplex. If you have one duplex, sometimes it can be a challenge that you might not think about is that if you do something for some one tenant, oh, yeah. then all of a sudden the n- other tenant is going to expect or at least request, you know, that you do that. Because they're going to talk. Because they're going to talk. You're going to come see each other going in and out, if, mm-hmm. even if, if, if they don't know each other. <laughs> and not to mention if in some of these areas, if you have two de- duplexes side by side, mm, and you put four. a now you've got four. You put a roof on one, or you fix the window or the shutters or the paint or do whatever Sounds you do. Sounds like you do. got some personal history Personal with experience with that, <laughs> yes. I only have one non-negotiable thing, and it's three zip codes that I just won't buy. Yeah. Are there certain types of houses you won't buy? Siding, one bed, two bedrooms. I'm very right. limited on siding, but when yeah. I say non-negotiable, there you go. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Maybe not. Maybe you'll make an exception. Well, if the price is right, right. Okay. But I don't care what you give me in three eight one one four, three eight one zero six, and three eight one two six. It doesn't matter. You can hand it to me free. I'm gonna give it right back, or do what yeah. you did. I'm gonna instantly sell it. <laughs>